In this video, we're going to talk about the sunyev zeldovich effect, which is an applied case of Compton upscattering. So here's the general picture of how the sunyev zeldovich effect, or SZ effect as it's sometimes called for short, works. After the Big Bang and inflation, the universe gradually expanded until eventually got cool enough that protons and electrons were able to bind to one another to form neutral hydrogen faster than the reverse process split them apart. This is called the epoch of recombination, which I'll draw on the left side of the page here as this kind of fireball that ends. And one consequence of recombination is that the cosmic microwave background, which is all the photons that were formerly bound to the photons and electrons here and interacted strongly with them when these were individual charged particles in a plasma, after recombination happened, these photons no longer strongly interacted with most of the baryonic matter in the universe. So as a result, after recombination, a lot of photons just started free streaming through the universe here with a characteristic black body spectrum that's been gradually cooling as the universe has expanded. Now en route to us today, some of these CMB photons pass through galaxy clusters in the early universe. And for our purpose here, these galaxy clusters were essentially clouds of hot electrons. Now these electrons were split off of the neutral hydrogen that collapsed into the structure of this cluster. And astrophysical processes such as star formation and x-ray heating from high mass black holes in the early universe ionized the hydrogen to create these, this bath of hot electrons here, which will take to be at some temperature Te for the temperature of the electrons. Now once we have free electrons again, these cosmic microwave background photons interact with those electrons. And we've discussed in previous lectures that Compton scattering is an important mechanism for describing how these photons interact with the electrons. And in the case here where we have hot electrons that have been heated up by these astrophysical properties and relatively low energy photons that are passing through this cluster, these photons are going to gain energy. And this is inverse Compton scattering. So one of these photons comes in here, and because this is a scattering process, bounces around many, many times inside of this cluster until finally it scatters out and continues on to where we see it today. Whereas other photons coming from other directions may have escaped interacting with that cluster or could have interacted with another cluster and they arrive to us in a different direction until we looking out with our telescope observe them today. Now earlier we derived that the power transferred by a single hot electron into a photon bath was given by 4 thirds times the Thomson cross section of an electron moving at relativistic speeds that are close to C colliding with a photon bath with energy density u sub pH that's energy per volume times the squared Lorentz factor associated with the re relativistic motion of these electrons times a beta squared factor where beta is just the ratio of the velocity of the electron to the speed of light, v over c. Now this is power, which is energy per time. And if we divided power by the collision rate, which is number of collisions per unit time, we get an estimate for the change in energy per collision which based on we, what we just wrote here is our expression for the power imparted on this photon bath divided by the collision rate of a single electron with a bunch of photons. And that's given by the number density of photons times the cross-section for a collision times the velocity of the electron, which we were taking to be close to C. So this is the energy imparted on a single photon via a single collision with one of these hot relativistic electrons. And that comes out to be 4 thirds gamma squared beta squared. And then we're dividing the energy density of this photon bath by the number density of photons here. So this has units of energy per volume. We're dividing out by a count per volume. So this ends up being a average energy of a photon here. So if we wanted to, we could say relative to the current energy of a photon, the fractional change in the energy that comes from colliding with one of these electrons is given by 4 thirds gamma squared beta squared. Now I'll remind you that 
gamma is 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, and we define beta to be v over c. And the last thing I'd like to do is, given a temperature of these electrons, work out how fast they're moving. And we can do that just by setting the kinetic energy of the electrons, 1 half MeV squared, to be the average kinetic energy of these electrons at this temperature, which for an electron gas is given by 3 halves KTE. So now what we're going to do in this particular case of the sunyal zadovich effect is we're going to take these electrons to be hot enough that we need to take into account their motion, but we're going to assume that they're basically non-relativistic. By saying they're non-relativistic, I'm saying that V is significantly smaller than C. Now you might complain, didn't I just use the fact that the electrons were moving close to the speed of light in this derivation? Well, yes, I did, but you'll see that I put in the speed of the electrons here as C, and I took it back out here as, as C when I divided by the collision rate. So in fact, I could, put a, could have put in any velocity of the electron here, and it would have canceled out. So making this assumption doesn't invalidate what we just did. But what it does allow us to do is to take gamma to be essentially 1. And beta is going to be very small. But we do have to keep our betas around because they directly multiply our energy change that happens through this inverse Compton scattering. So if we drop our gammas, this is going to be 4 thirds beta squared. And beta, you remember, is v over c. And v squared is 3 halves k times the temperature of the electrons. So in fact, we can write this as 4 thirds of 3 kte divided by the mass of the electron c squared, which was in the bottom of our beta here. So that's 4 k t sub e over me c squared. And just to be clear here, for non-relativistic electrons here, our temperature can't be too high. So KTE is going to be much smaller than the rest energy associated with the mass of this electron. So this whole thing right here is much less than 1. So suppose we start with a photon at energy E. Well, after one collision, its energy gets bumped up by this delta E factor here, which was 4 KTE over MEC squared. So now we have a more energetic photon that just hit a hot electron scattered off and is still moving through this cluster. And in fact, it could hit another electron. And if it did that, it might get scattered again by another 1 plus 4 KTE over MEC squared. And I've written this in a greener color to indicate that our electron is getting a little more energetic, to indicate that our photon is getting a little more energetic here. And in fact, it might scatter again and we pick up yet another factor here as we get even more energy. And because this is a multiplicative factor each time, these just chain together. In fact, this just looks like compound interest. So that the energy that we measure when this photon finally scatters out of this electron cloud that is the cluster, is going to be the initial energy times 1 plus 4 kte mec squared to the nth power, where n is the number of collisions that occurred. And of course we expect a lot of collisions to occur because clusters are very large. So as n goes to infinity, we get that the final energy goes to the initial energy times e to the 4y, where we define y to be kte over me c squared. And this is sometimes called the Compton y parameter. Oh, and one key important thing in the y parameter, I forgot to put in n, the number of scatterings. So in the limit of high number of scatterings, this becomes an exponential that depends on y, which depends on the number of scatterings through, through this cluster. So it'd be nice to get a bit of better handle on the number of scatterings we can expect a photon to go through passing through this cluster. And a reasonable way we could estimate this is to take the total width of this cluster, L, and assume that this photon is taking a random walk through this cluster. So we know that for some mean free path between collisions, lambda MFP, the mean free path between collisions, that for random walks, the number of collisions that you have to go through before these mean free path lengths added with random signs comes out to be L goes quadratically 
with the number of mean free paths. And we know that a length measured in the number of mean free paths for a photon is really just the optical depth. So n is approximately the optical depth to electron scattering squared. Now since we started talking about photons scattering off electrons as optical depth, we know that in general the intensity of the photon field is going to drop off as e to the minus tau, which the first order is 1 minus tau. So while this result holds in the optically thick case, where we have a lot of scatterings to get out of this cluster, in the optically thin case, the number of scatterings to get through this cluster is actually just going to go linearly with tau. So if we suppose we don't know whether we're optically thick or optically thin, we can write that n is the product of tau with 1 plus tau. And I've inverted the sign on tau here such that because we're essentially squaring it here that we'll come out with a positive sign here. So in the optically thin case, this goes to tau. And in the optically thick case, this goes to tau squared. So this is a more general expression for the number of collisions we can expect a photon to go through as it passes through a, cl a cluster, both in the optically thin and optically thick cases. So in this case, y becomes k t sub e for m e c squared times tau e times 1 plus tau e. So let's start plugging in some numbers to get a feel for what y might be for a typical cluster. We'll take the number density of electrons to be something like 3 times 10 to the minus 3 inverse centimeters cubed. The Thompson cross-section, which is a good number to always remember, is of order 10 to the minus 24 centimeters squared. Size of a typical cluster, well, let's see, the number that comes to mind is megaparsecs. So that's a million parsecs, and each parsec is 3 times 10 to the 18 centimeters. So we end up with 3e24 centimeters. So that right there gives us that our optical depth, tau sub e, is of order 10 to the minus 2, using our expression right up here. Now if we take kte to be of order a few kilo electron volts, keV, and the energy associated with the rest mass of an electron is of order half an MeV, then the ratio here of kte over MEC squared is also going to be of order 10 to the minus 2. So y ended up being, because we're optically thin here, tau e is small, we just pick up the one factor of tau e. y is going to be of order 10 to the minus 4. So in this case, if we take the initial energy of a CMB photon and apply e to the 4y, where y is 10 to the minus 4, we're going to end up with a final energy is about a few ten thousands higher. Now this seems really tiny, but it means that the observed temperature of the cosmic microwave background, which is of order 3 Kelvin, after it passes through a cluster, is changed by of order 10 millikelvin. Now where did I get 10 millikelvin from? You'd think that 4 times 10 to the minus 4 times something like 3 Kelvin ends up with 10 to the minus 3. So you'd think 1 millikelvin. But if we look at a black body spectrum in the Rayleigh genes tail, then the flux is given by 2k tcmb over lambda squared. And the problem is we picked up another two factors of lambda here, which means we get a, one, a factor of 1 over 1 plus 4y squared. So to first order, this becomes 1 minus 8y for a small y. So this actually says that on a Rayleigh genes tail, the change in the temperature of the CMB is actually of order minus 10 millikelvin. Now this might surprise you because you were thinking that we should have been injecting energy into the photons from these electrons. So why aren't we raising the temperature of the CMB? Well, in fact, we are. But because this is a scattering process, we're taking photons that are low energy and we're turning them into higher energy photons. So if you take the black body spectrum of the cosmic microwave background, is log intensity versus log frequency here. And the Rayleigh genes tail over here, we're actually robbing photons and we're turning them into higher energy photons. And that's because this is a scattering process. The photon number is conserved. So if we just look at, relative to the standard CMB black body, what happened to the spectrum of the CMB as it passed through a cluster, you'll see that it actually gets less bright at some frequencies, and then you get it being brighter 
at higher frequencies, reflecting the, the photons that were over here that got moved in energy, so they got changed in frequency here. And this is a, a characteristic that, if you're doing CMB analysis, you can use to know that you're seeing the Sanyel Zeldovich effect. And something worth remembering is this crossover frequency right here is at 218 gigahertz. So that's a magic number for the SZ effect. It's the frequency at which the number of photons that were upscattered out of that band matches the number of photons that were upscattered into that band. And what you'd see is if you were making a picture of the sky at three different frequencies, you have some average brightness that comes from the cosmic microwave background out here. Then at frequencies below 218 gigahertz, you'll see absorption features from the SZ effect. You'll see what essentially look like holes in the CMB. And then exactly at 218 gigahertz, you're not going to see any effect. And then above 218 gigahertz, but not too far above, you're going to see some excess emission in the same place. And that's how you know you found an SZ cluster. So that's the sanyaev zeldovich effect, or SZ effect, which is the scattering of cosmic microwave background photons from hot electrons associated with a cluster.